Well, here we go. Welcome to the Cabinet Maker Profit System Podcast. It's just for wood shop owners like cabinet makers, architecture mill workers, and closet companies who are interested in the business of the wood shop business. Look, if you're at a place where you're excited because you're already at a million or two million a year in sales, but you're also wise enough to know you need some new answers to old problems, then you are ready. Because this show is all about getting you to the next level by working smarter, not just harder. Now, today's guest is going to be Danny Small. You can catch Danny on LinkedIn, look him up under Daniel Small. And while you're there, connect with me too, Dominic Rubino. If you're not on LinkedIn, you really should be. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about wasted time in my shop is driving me crazy, which is about lean manufacturing. Now, hang on a second. Some of you are going to say, I don't want to listen to this episode. You don't understand cabinetry. You don't understand closets. We don't need lean manufacturing. Look, lean manufacturing, uh, also known as Kaizen, or constant and never-ending improvement or continuous improvement is about the process, not the product. And I should point out that we always talk about it as if it's on the shop floor, but lean also applies to the office. How do you just do things better, smarter, faster without working harder, 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 right? Here's why the episode is important with Danny and I. Danny's going to show us how to be methodical and creative at the same time. You know, wasted efforts in your shop is nothing but wasted money, wasted time and wasted budget. So when you're you're going over time and over budget on jobs, there's a way to find that efficiency back in the company. I want you to make good decisions based on data and facts rather than gut feelings so you can increase capacity and get better results. You see, at some point in your business, the money's not in the sawdust anymore. It comes from thinking differently. Today, I want you to take a step back and look at the whole picture, ask different questions, and then get yourself some different results. That's what Danny and I are going to cover today. Look, there's simple systems to help you run this company, make the money you deserve, live the life you want. Those simple systems give you the quiet confidence to take this company wherever you want to get to. Do this with me right now. Put your shoulders back, lift up your chin just by a quarter of an inch, take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. That's quiet confidence. That is that power inside you to be the business owner, to take this company where you want to get it to next. If I had to summarize everything for you, this podcast is actually about the mindset of growth and success for you as a business owner. Crazy that we're talking about this through the filter of cabinetry. Now, I just said mindset. So speaking of mindset, I've got a dad joke for you today. Now, why dad jokes and why bad jokes? And why a dad joke poorly delivered with poor timing? Because I want to get you laughing and I want to get your mind open to hear what our guest Danny has to say today. So here's a good story. Instead of a bunch of dad jokes, I'm going to share one story with you. It has to do with lean manufacturing. It actually takes a little bit of a shot at me too, and I'm okay with it. So there's this cowboy. He's riding range in a remote cattle lease. Suddenly, a brand new Rivian comes up the gravel road, big cloud of dust. The driver's a young man in a yellow golf shirt. He's got sunglasses on his head, Italian slacks, leather loafers with no socks, of course. Kid's wearing a Rolex that could choke a buzzard. He gets out of his fancy electric truck and strikes up a convo with a cowboy. He says, if I tell you exactly how many cows you have in this herd, will you let me milk one? I'm a big Instagram influencer, and I want to show people how to make their own healthy yogurt and butter. Cowboy chews on his toothpick a bit, looks at his herd, looks back at the Instagram influencer, and just calmly says, sure. Well, the young city slicker takes out his new iPhone, connects his Bluetooth to his Rivian, connects that to his Starlink internet, at the same time, he sets up a tripod so he can start recording. It starts giving the cowboy a play-by-play. -play. Right now, I'm on Google Earth. I've got a backlink into a NASA satellite server. Our GPS location's punched in. It's going to give me the exact number on this herd of cows. Today, I'm going to show you how to make your own yogurt and butter. Whiz bang. It only takes a few seconds. He looks down at his phone, gets a big smile on his face, turns to the cowboy and said, you have exactly 243 cows here. Cowboy says, well, yep, looks like you're right. Go ahead and milk one of them there cows. Well, the smile comes across the young man's face. This city slicker, he goes to his Rivian, pulls out his bucket and a stool, moves his camera to get the best angle, the best lighting for the video, walks up to one of the cows, and he's just about to get to work. Cowboy interrupts him and says, we can make this interesting. If I can tell you exactly what your line of work is, why don't we reverse the bet? Well, the young man's face lights up. He looks to the camera and he says, okay, why not? Accepts the challenge. Cowboy takes the toothpick out of his mouth and says, well, I'm pretty sure you're a consultant. 
well, the Instagram influencer stops for a second and said, that's, yeah, that's right. But how'd you guess that? I didn't need to guess, said the cowboy. You turned up here even though nobody called you. You want to get paid for an answer I already knew to a question I never asked? You don't know nothing about my business. Now, get away from that bull before you get hurt. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that joke. <laughs> Make sure you tell that one in the next 24 hours. In the next 24 hours. Hey, look, I host this podcast because one day I would be proud to be your business coach. Matter of fact, I have a team of business coaches I've personally hand-selected and trained. I have very high expectations for the people that join my team, and I'm proud of every single one of them. With that being said, I'm going to go into business coach mode right now. I have two simple actions for you. Number one, I'm going to challenge you. Danny and I are going to challenge you because today in this episode, you're going to hear something or learn something or maybe realize something you already knew and forgot about. But whatever it is, I want you to take action in the next 24 hours. And then I want you to pay attention to how that improves your business or your life. And then number two, I want you to think on this very simple idea. Are you happy being a contractor? feel stuck at one or 2 million a year, or are you ready to learn the steps to get you to the next level? By the end of today's episode, you're going to know the answer. So let's get to it. Mr. Danny Small, how are you? Good. How are you, Dominic? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm excited. I have to tell you. You know why I'm excited? Why are you excited? Because we're going to answer a lot of frustrations that people have today, I think. Or maybe we'll cause some more. Of it. We might cause some more frustrations. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But eventually they'll get solved. Eventually, eventually all problems get solved. It's just whether we run out of time on, the, on God's good earth before. <laughs> that's a good point. Before we teeter over. Yeah, that's. I like your background there. Thank you. Yeah, you've got uh, Da Vinci's. What, what's the name of that image there? Da Vinci's man. That is. Uh, oh, now I'm drawing a blank on it. That, but there's a name for it. It's. Uh, um, it's from a city, I think that uh, it's uh, it's named after. I think it's uh, the city where he was when he designed it, or something like that. But yeah. uh, it's uh, yeah. it's Da Vinci's starfish man. Everybody knows what I mean starfish now. Man. He's a starfish man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For people who can't see this as a YouTube video, they might just be listening on a podcast. So. Yeah. Um, hey, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, Danny Small, who the heck are you? And how is it you come to be speaking to all these finished wood trades experts who are trying to run businesses, doing a great job of it, facing forward, but looking for answers all over the world? Well, I'm glad you asked, Dominic. Um, so I guess my, my story starts... Uh, Back in college, I got my uh, undergrad degree in mechanical engineering, and mm. that started my, I guess, my passion, my love affair, if you will, with manufacturing. Um, mm. Just um, really fell in love with that there. Uh, and soon after I left college, I got introduced to the construction industry, got hired by a friend of a friend as a laborer. Yeah. Um, I, I had built a startup with my older mm. brother, and uh, then decided that I uh, wanted to go do something else rather than work with my brother um, <laughs> for various reasons. That was a quickly oh, skimmed over story. To. That was good. Yeah, that was good. No, well, that, yeah, there's there's definitely more there, but uh, another time. Um, so uh, relocated and a friend of a friend hired me as a laborer for his uh, semi-custom home building company. Mm. Um, and from there, uh, went into... Um, sales and marketing and business development and took, took over the, the marketing function for that company and a sister company. Um, we also did high performance building systems and insulation. So I got trained in building science nice. while I was doing that. Uh, so I got to do some building science consulting and design, et cetera. Um, worked for a time for um, Pella, Windows and Doors which uh, right. I think is uh, closely related to uh, they're just a small audience company. and what they do. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, yeah, worked, uh, did some sales for, for Pella and then uh, built a couple of uh, startups in the uh, high performance building systems space. And uh, after the great recession, I uh, used my uh, energy efficiency background to get a job for certain Teed corporation out in Philadelphia. 
Mm. Spent uh, five years there in their innovation and uh, building science department, helping manage their innovation and product development department. Um, and that was really fascinating, but uh, learned a lot of things uh, that were frustrating for me in, in the construction and building products industry. Frustrating um, how? Well, just the inefficient way in which a lot of big companies develop new products and new solutions. Oh, okay. Um, they just spend a, a They're whole not very lot of money. Nimble. They're not nimble. No. They, yeah, they try to throw money at the problem, not... Yeah. And I, I always say cleverness is going to solve your problems, not money. Right. You have to have invest some money, you know, in new types of racking or flooring or something like that. But it's not always just throwing money at the problem. It's being yeah. clever. Yeah. And I, I, I really think that uh, money used in a, to address a problem and the creativity used are inversely proportional. In other words, when you intentionally constrain the money, yeah. the creativity goes up, right? Because you're forced to be creative. Right. So when you've uh, actually having a lot of money can be a real curse when it comes to innovation. Yeah. So that's what I observed at Certainty. But uh, while I was there, I got my MBA and uh, then went over into uh, consulting in construction, uh, consulted with a small boutique consulting firm in strategy and operations and innovation. Mm. And uh, then in uh, 2020, when COVID hit, um, I got downsized and I thought, well, Perfect opportunity to uh, start my own thing. I had been introduced to offsite construction, mm. um, you know, including all forms, you know, modular, panelized, uh, component manufacturing, that kind of thing. Um, while I was at Certainty, and really loved that. That I fell in love with that immediately. I think it was my engineering brain just really latched onto that, and it made right. a ton of sense. So when I started my own consulting firm in 2020. Um, I decided I was going to focus on the offsite and prefab world uh, and help companies who basically any company that that builds or manufactures some component that's going to end up being part of a building. And that's our audience entirely. Exactly. Cabinet makers, architectural mill workers, uh, even yeah. people here who run closet businesses or furniture. I mean, it's it all follows I, the same format. And I like the way you define that ends up part of a building somehow. Yep. Yep. So that's that's the audience that I serve and uh, started off doing uh, work in innovation since I had a lot of background in innovation and uh, uh, efficiency in, in that area. But, but uh, uh, along the way, early on, I got uh, certified as a Lean Six Sigma black belt mm. and started to work in um, again with my background in mechanical engineering and manufacturing. I started to work in some uh, advice and and helping companies with their process, helping them to become more efficient, and helping them to drive out waste, et cetera. So yeah. that's become most of what I actually do now. Um, the innovation thing is still there, but probably 90% of my work is in uh, process efficiency for these types of uh, I was going to say, in bringing innovation to processes, I know it's probably not the definition you use, but I think innovation is a big part of it because sometimes the the, the most effective changes are simple systems, simple, easy little things that, yeah. that don't have to be complicated, don't have to be expensive, but they're they're innovative. Yep. And so today we invited you on here to talk to us about wasted time in my shop is driving me crazy. That's have you, has anybody, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank God, because that's why you're here. <laughs> right. What are, I'm not in the wrong spot. <laughs> so and you've got a wide range. So you're not just in the cabinet. You know, I'm in the cabinetry space, so I'm comfortable mm -hmm. here. Uh, but yeah. you're not just in the cabinetry space. Do you mean that other industries are also looking at continuous improvement in what they do? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's a great point. I mean, the the roots of this whole lean and continuous improvement movement started in Japan way back in the 1960s as the Toyota production system um, right. and evolved into what's known as lean nowadays. But yeah, it's it has helped hundreds of thousands of companies over the decades in traditional, originally traditional, you know, auto manufacturing, then other types of manufacturing. And then it eventually spread to service industries, right? Yeah. Finance, healthcare, um, all kinds of industries. Uh, interestingly, though, the construction industry and related manufacturing industries, um, including offsite construction, 
has kind of uh, not really benefited much from that yet. It it, it hasn't been uh, adopted much in the construction industry. And so um, that was one of the big reasons I wanted to focus on this was because I saw uh, a hole that needed to be filled in this mm-hmm. industry for to bring these tried and tested decades old principles um, that have proven to be wildly successful in just about every other industry in the world, bring those to construction, specifically offsite or uh, uh, fab, um, you know, uh, factory based construction right. um, to help them gain the same benefits as all these other industries have. It just because I, I love doing this. I like one of the things I like on the show is messing with people's brains, <laughs> right? You're because mess if, with my brain. Uh, well, I'm not. We're trying to mess with everybody who's listening. Oh, got it. Okay. Because everybody who's listening thinks everybody else in the world runs a cabinet shop or a mill workshop, and they don't. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. who else out there are you talking to, industry wise? We don't need to use company names. W- what are they making that's similar sure. to what you and I have talked about that a cabinet shop does? Look. W- Tell us yeah. some of those examples so that we can start to open up our mind and see the other opportunities or find other avenues for learning. Right, right. No, that's a great question. So um, some of the big categories of offsite construction that I deal with are mm. like modular, modular uh, home builders or modular manufacturers, right? That, mm. that build these big modules that that go together like Legos on site. Uh, everybody's probably heard of and, and maybe even seen examples yeah. of that. Ken Semler um, was a guest on our show, and I think he has Modular yep. Home Magazine as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's just a guest, yeah. Uh, Offsite Builder is, is his new magazine. I, that's I it. That's write it. every month for that. Uh, oh, I didn't know magazine, that. Okay. As a matter of fact, yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the big areas that I that I deal with a lot. A lot of my clients do that very thing. They, mm-hmm. they do uh, modular manufacturing. Then there's also panelizers, uh, wall panel manufacturers, who right. build just uh, walls. Right. They'll build um, either just empty walls that are nothing but structure or sometimes they'll have some type of sheathing or or surface on one side or the other. Sometimes they'll have insulation and and mechanical, electrical and plumbing on the inside. So There's varying degrees of uh, finish for those types of things. But panelizers is, an, is another large category. Um, from there, there are precast concrete uh, manufacturers yeah. that cast concrete into various shapes in a factory and then ship those out to be assembled into a building or maybe even a bridge. A bridge, yeah. Um, there are also um, uh, timber frame manufacturers who mill timber into various uh, structural beams and shapes to I, uh, I usually then make them into that. kits. Yeah, I had, it, you're right. I just had not even thought of that. We actually have a couple of log home playground people yep. Yep. I don't name names listening to the show because they you know there's probably not a podcast for them yeah so log homes is another category uh there there there's an association under the uh national association of home builders the systems built uh uh committee or something like that that uh, that caters mostly to these timber frame folks and these log log home hmm. folks so wow. that's another category then there's um there's pod manufacturers. I don't know if your your listeners have heard of pods, but th- basically you can build a self-contained bathroom, for example, in a factory um, with the walls, ceiling, uh, floor, etc., and then everything in that bathroom completely finished. And then all you have to do is pick that thing up, ship it to the site, and then drop it into a commercial building, and bathroom done that quick. So. Uh, different types wow. of pods are another type of thing that are manufactured in a in a factory. And of course, there's there's cabinet manufacturers, there's window manufacturers, other um, system or component manufacturers that that make different things to go into uh, different parts of a building. There are uh, other structural building component manufacturers like trusses, um, and uh, you know MEP. Uh, I understand now yeah, they're, they're panelizing MEP, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So you just yep do four foot sections at a time, put them together yep. like Lego and imagine what that does to job costing. Oh, yeah. And imagine when you're bidding against a guy who's doing that and you're not, you're still doing it the manual way. Right. You're wondering why. Yeah. You're so single trade prefab was the last one that I was going to mention. And, and that's, that's exactly right. A lot of MEP contractors are starting to uh, 
um, establish a, a prefab shop where they prefabricate various components for their uh, for their scope and they ship it out and just plop it in. Yeah, I've noticed that the OCD plumbers love to do that. OCD plumbers and electricians, they want to create their breaker box with all the colored wires looking nice. And, and all or the perfect. plumbers do the same yeah. thing. It's all perfect. And it does look great. Yeah. But it also saves them a lot of time because they get on that site, they just pop it on the wall, and then off they go. Yep. yep. So thank you for that. was an excellent overview. And I think we got everybody juiced up here because now the questions are starting to flow. What about this? You don't know my shop. And ah, mm -hmm. my guys. Let's talk for a little bit. Let's go to, in a, to a weird direction. The, the companies that you work with, do they have magical employees who are all totally bought in to continuous improvement and can't wait to do things smoother, faster, better? <laughs> uh, not quite. Oh, I, was, um, I thought maybe you had some sort of uh, genie's lamp. No, uh, not not to get them there before I start with them. Um, mm. It's they they often end up there by the time I'm done. Uh, but it's not by magic. It's by uh, good old fashioned hard work. But uh, yeah, usually when I walk into a place, um, I'm met with a lot of skepticism, a yeah. lot of doubt and a lot of, OK, what's what now? Right. What's the boss got going on now? What's the uh, strategy strategy du jour, so to speak, you know, um, that he's got us doing or she? Um, so yeah, a lot of skepticism, a lot of people that, uh, don't understand it. It is not well, uh, known again, like I said, in the construction industry in particular, yeah. um, in other manufacturing industries, very well known. And it's, it's like a Bible, but in construction, we just don't know about it much yet. So when I come in and I introduce the concepts, it is like a blank slate. These people, most of them have, have not heard of this at all. Right. Um, so it takes a lot of winning over throughout the, the course of my work. Can we go down that path for a second? This is still within the topic. You know, the waste of time in my shop is driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. At some point, we've got to get our team on board, like, like yeah. you said. And sometimes yeah. our team is a little bit bruised. They're like, oh, boss read a book this week, this weekend, right? <laughs> right? He's got yeah. quotes everywhere from Timothy Ferris. Then next week, he's got quotes everywhere on time management. Then next week, it's quotes from some stoic philosopher. You know, mm -hmm. boss read a book this week is kind of a joke I've heard in, in other companies. But what are some things that you would suggest to an owner out there who's already bought in, who wants to make these changes, but is finding resistance from their team? How, let's say that we were going to be your client. How would you, how should we warm up our crew for you to show up? I love that question because there, uh, I've definitely over the years of, uh, of dealing with this and, uh, you know, having to figure out ways to to warm up these crews, yeah. I found that the, the best way that I know of so far is to help them understand, first of all, that this is about, this isn't about their boss's ego. This isn't about, you know, um, strategy or, you know, some high level um, planning from the ivory tower. This is about them. Uh, those line workers, the, the, the folks who actually produce things in the factory, they're actually the stars of the show. And I help them understand that, and this is no BS, I truly believe, and, and Lean is, is centered on this fact, that where the value is produced is the center of where the company, that's, that's the heartbeat of the whole right. company. Um, yeah. If you don't, in a manufacturing company, including all types of offsite manufacturing, you don't produce something, you have no company. Therefore, the people that produce something are the most important people in that company, right? And so I tell them, that's the some of the first words out of my mouth when I show up and I do my lean training at the very beginning of my program with my clients. I let those staff workers know, hey, I'm here for you. And I want, and I've already told your boss that he works for you. He's right. here to support you. Right. His, his or her function is to figure out what you need and to make your job easier by providing resources and removing roadblocks. Mm. That's what they exist for. You're here to keep this company going and, and you're behind the success of this company. And everything that I'm about to do with you is to make your job easier. 
Yeah. And how often move roadblocks and to, to help remove struggle from your work every day. Yeah. And that seems to work pretty well. Well, at, at the start of it, yeah, we should talk a little bit more about how uh, opinions and attitudes change as we show people the tools. But how often do people say to you or mumble, you can tell from body language, he just wants us to work harder. He just wants us to work mm-hmm. faster. Yeah, I think that that's, that's probably uh, on the minds of most of the people when I first show up, right? You know, the, okay, they're bringing some guy in to crack the whip and just make us go harder. Right. And try to just squeeze more work out of us in, right. in, in a certain amount of time. And I'm, I'm very adamant that, in fact, the opposite is the truth. We want them to have an easier time working. We want them to be able to um, work with, with flow, as we say, right? To have things to be able to just smoothly do their work without mm. struggle, without difficulty, without you know, um, hurrying, right? Uh, it's not about hurrying. It's not about working harder. It's about developing a process that allows them to be productive without killing themselves. Yeah. It's it's amazing to me still when I walk into a really high producing shop and it's quiet. Yeah. And it doesn't look like anything's going, you look around and you're like, is anything being done? Because no, but nobody's in a rush. Yeah. The, there's no crazy frantic music in the background, you know, that old piano. Right. None of that's happening. It all looks like it's very calm and very smooth. It actually looks like nothing's happening at all, which would freak the heck out of an owner if they weren't aware that they're actually observing a really cool process. Yeah. 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 A, a good process is not high effort. It's not. It's not frantic. It's not uh, difficult. It uh, it flows smoothly and it, uh, it it's, you know, relaxed, so to speak. It has flow, as we say. Yeah. If um, if somebody came to you and said, let's go back to the topic, wasted time in the shop is driving me crazy. So let's mm-hmm. assume that somebody who's listening is actually on the phone with you and they're like, Danny, there's so much wasted time in my shop. What would your what would your next couple of questions be to let's say it's to me? I'm going to say, Danny, there's so much wasted time in my shop. You're going to go, Dom, let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. Well, first I'm going to say, Dom, you're right. You do have a lot of wasted time in your shop because everybody does. We do. That's true. Yeah. You know, uh, as as we say um, in, in lean circles, 90% of everything everyone does is waste. Uh, it's And when I first start to break down and, and analyze my clients' processes, it's pretty shocking to them to learn just how much of the, the work going on is non-value add time or, or waste. Um, so yes, it's true. They do have a lot of wasted time. Now, um, the caveat to that is that there's some non-value add time or another word for waste that is necessary. There are things that we have to do that are mm. not going to add value to the product that we're manufacturing. And that's just, just a, a way of life, right? We have to carry stuff around. We have to inspect things. We have to clean. We have to, you know, uh, move back and forth to a certain extent. And none of those things adds value to the the cabinet that we're building, for example. Yeah, it doesn't change the fit, form, or function, as our our friend Rick Patak would say. It doesn't change. It doesn't actually sand the piece of wood. It doesn't join it together, but it's part of the, I don't know, admin. It's everything around it that has to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we call those necessary wastes. Now, that's not to say that we can't reduce those because those can be reduced dramatically, right? So we want to um, shrink those down to increase the ratio of time spent on adding value. Right. Um, but uh, there are things that we're, we're never going to get to 100% value add time, 100% um, you know, uh, productive time, so to speak. There's always going to be some things that we have to do in between adding value. But the goal is to shrink those down so we can do those uh, as quickly as possible and get to the the value addition, which is actually producing a product. So if the, if the subject here is wasted time in the shop is driving me crazy, mm-hmm. how often do you then come into a shop and realize there's actually waste in the office that is leading to waste in the shop? Oh, you're nodding your head. 
Yeah. Can't be, can't, and I wonder if you find the same thing I do. I'll, I'll go first so that you can disagree with me. I mm-hmm. often find that owners who are thinking about continuous improvement think it's only for the floor. Right. And they don't realize they've got wastes in the administration side, you know, the paperwork and processing and software. How, yeah. How, yeah. That's very common. Um, and, you know, the, the, the evidence that there is plenty of waste to be reduced in an office environment, in a non-production environment, is evidenced by the fact that lean has been adopted so successfully in non-manufacturing industries, right? Hospitals. Finance, yeah. healthcare, right? Uh, places that have no, no factory, no production, right? It's all services, it's all office work, mm. right? And yet these companies, um, they implement lean principles and it completely changes their entire company because there's there's so much to be done. Really, lean is the apl- uh, the application of of uh, waste identification and reduction principles to any process. And that process um, can be a, a process of making something or it can be a process of providing a service. It can be a process of you know, providing advisory or, or you know, um, intellectual property. Everything has a process and therefore lean applies to every process. Hmm. So we've got, uh, we've got a couple answers here for people that are maybe frustrated because wasted time is, is killing them. Where do we start? Do we start with the people? Do we start with the process? Do we, where does an owner start in this whole path? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, for me, with my clients, uh, you know, since I'm focused on on uh, companies who do have a production facility, um, I start there because uh, that's where the value is added, right? That's what we call the gemba. That's the real place. That's mm-hmm. the place where where we create value. Yes, sir. So, sorry, just because you introduced a word that some other people may not have heard before. What you said that's where we int- that's where we introduced the gemba. Gemba. Yep. What's Gemba? Yeah. That's a Japanese term that means it, it refers to the origin or the real place. It, it basically refers to where value is added, where the company's value for their customers is created. Mm. So in a manufacturing company, um, the place where you make your money, in other words, the, the, the place where you do the things that your company pays you to do is in that factory. Mm. Okay. In a in a, in a uh, an accounting firm, the place where they do the things that their clients pay them for is in an office. So that's where we would start. But in any manufacturing firm, the place where you do the things that your company pays you to do is in your factory. So that's where I start. Yeah. Now that's not to say that there isn't plenty of waste to be had in the office part of those companies. Sure. Uh, and it, and it often affects the the factory. But I always start at the Gemba, which is where we produce value for the company. What uh, can you give us a couple stories, or maybe just one story of going on a Gemba walk with somebody, and it's just so clear. And then, if you if you have that story, what was the resolution? Yeah. Uh, so a great Gemba Gemba walk story. So to and, and you've kind of extended the term. The Gemba walk is a practice that I teach my clients that is part of, of lean methodology, which is basically the, the boss, right? Or some uh, high leader, usually, I, I prefer that it be the, the president or CEO, right? But they mm-hmm. walk out to the factory floor and they just, they walk around. Um, and um, while they're walking around, there are a few things that they do. They observe what's going on. They observe the work that's taking place. Mm-hmm. And then they strike up conversations with the people who are doing the work. Um, so the goal of a Gemba walk is to glean ways to reduce waste, ways to increase efficiency, right? And you can do that by both just watching and you'll pick up a lot of things just by watching how the workers work. Mm-hmm. You'll notice things that they're spending a lot of time on, things that, that they're getting stuck on, things that are causing them to have to do a lot of walking or other types of waste. So you'll see those things just by observing. But then when you add in the conversations, then you get some really cool uh, things happening. Because when you when you walk up and you say, hey, 
tell me about what you're doing here. Tell, walk me through the process of what you do every day for, for this job. Yeah. First of all, that, that shows them that you're there to support them, that you're interested in what they do. You're not just, you know, sitting in your office all day, you know, um, just kind of leading from afar. You're there and you're involved and you want to understand this intimately. But also it gives them an opportunity to talk to you about their struggles. And in fact, uh. I advise these presidents to ask, what can you think of anything that that um, gets in your way every day or that's frustrating or th something that I can do to remove an obstacle or make your job easier for you? That's a magic question because when you ask that question, nine times out of 10, the employee will just start Blurt. to- Yeah, yes. why Why are there never any pipe clamps in this place? Exactly. They'll right, just it's just something on on so on. basic, yeah. And so one particular uh, experience that I had with this was with a client that I uh, I just was at their uh, facility this week, actually, and just wrapped up the program. Um, but uh, early on, when I was teaching the principle of Gemba Walks, I went out with the CEO. We walked out to the first station. Yeah. And um, he asked, as I had instructed him, yeah, you know, he talked about how he was there to, to learn about the job and to find out how he could, could make things better. And he asked the employee, you know, can you, do you have any ideas on how we can make this process more efficient? And he barely even gotten the question out. And the guy was like, yes, we need new uh, jigs for this, uh, for this operation. Right. He was like, really, what do you mean? And he says, well, the jigs, because they fabricated their own jigs. They did a lot mm -hmm. of welding in the shop. And so he said, the guy that made this, this jig, he was left-handed. So he made it for a lefty. And it's perfect for a left-handed person, but I'm right-handed. And so for me, so this jig actually creates a lot of extra time, a lot of extra, you know, wasted time because I have to reach around in a really awkward way with my right hand. <laughs> he says, um, so I, I need a new jig. And uh, and I said, I said, uh, can you show us what you mean? And she says, yeah, come here. So he, he walked us over and he showed us the jig that he was using. He showed us exactly what needed to change about it. And I said, can you make the right kind of jig that you need? He says, absolutely. I said, how long would it take you? I don't know, maybe half an hour. I said, can you get it done today? Sure. So love it. He, he goes and, and, and we, we told him to, to, uh, to make the right kind of jig. But I said, how long, how much extra time do you think it's taking you yeah. to do this because you've got the wrong jig? He says, Probably for every one of these units that we're manufacturing, I probably spend an extra two hours. What? Yes. Just because, because of the messing with this jig and having to do it backwards, basically. Climb. He has to, I, I, he says I have to climb up and down a ladder twice for each one to get to it. He says probably about two hours for each one of these boxes. And oh. you know he's he's earning uh, all in. He's probably earning 35, 40 bucks an hour um with uh with benefits etc et cetera. so that really adds up yeah so i told him and i got permission you know i said is that okay to the ceo he's like yeah do it so um we walked away and uh you know he he, he built the jig that day and uh, started using it but as i was walking away i said to the ceo i said do you realize what just happened we we walked onto the floor yeah. 15 seconds in after one question, <laughs> you just got an idea that's probably worth about five or six thousand dollars to you every month, every month, forever yeah. for the life of the business. Exactly. Yeah. Let's not make jigs left handed only. Yeah. Right. So it was a it was a huge lesson for him. And he was just flabbergasted. I yeah. said, that's this cool. kind of thing will happen practically every time you do this, if you make this a regular practice, because all of your best ideas for improving your process are in the minds of these people. And I pointed out, you notice he's been doing this. This guy has been doing this work for weeks, but he hasn't said a thing. Right. Very quietly. And he never would have if so, you hadn't asked him. So I was just going to ask on that point, is that, you know, when we talked earlier about the resistance that you get from the crew. Mm -hmm. When you go up to Johnny and you're doing the, the, the Gemba walk, 
and you come up with that idea and you let him go and make the win. Does that create kind of a competition amongst others? Like, well, I got an idea too. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I hear, I hear sometimes, you know, cause we're, we're never able to get through the whole factory uh, floor in one mm. Gemba walk. And so, you know, we'll have a conversation with a couple of people and then we have to go, go on to something else. Um, and then I'll hear like the next day or, or later on, you know, I, I, I heard from a bunch of my people on the line that, uh, you know, they've got stuff that they want to contribute or they've got ideas or, you know, they saw How you talking to, to so-and-so and, and they want to, they want to tell us about more ideas that they have. So it tends to, uh, feed on itself and, and really snowball once you get started. Yeah. Interesting then that, you know, our topic, which is wasted time on my shop is driving me crazy. If we look back at that guy who was climbing up and down a ladder a couple of times on a left-handed jig, mm -hmm. wasted time on the shop floor was driving him crazy too. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and that's an excellent point. If, if wasted time on the shop floor is driving you crazy as the leader, I guarantee you it's driving your line staff even crazier because I mean, I honestly believe that almost everybody that works for these, these uh, firms wants to do good work, right? Nobody wants to go to work and do, do slop, do a sloppy job or struggle to do their job. They want to do quality work and they want to uh, not have, trouble and difficulty and and hurdles to get through all day every day right um so if it's driving you nuts as the leader it's it's guaranteed driving your people nuts a lot more and a yeah. lot more consistently so we probably just have to get over this initial resistance that we get and people are resistant to change it's just normal it's, mm -hmm. it's, you and i are resistant to some sort of change we know we need to make just think about how many of us have a gym card in our wallet that we never use <laughs> right we're just not we're resistant to the change of going to the gym after work or in the morning or some other time yeah yeah uh so if you had some advice to give a, a business owner who's who's got a level of frustration around they just know that they could be getting product out faster cabinets could be going out faster or smoother or safer mm -hmm. um what, what would your suggestion be well, I think the first thing that needs to happen is you need to get a real grasp on what, what is actually going on on your line, right? What are your people spending their time doing? Because as we talked about earlier, the vast majority of it is probably not adding value. So mm -hmm. look at the, the things that they're doing that are not adding value. You know, observe the process, find out, you know, when and where and how much people are walking back and forth or having to go uh, to get things and bring them back or messing with their tools or, um, you know, uh, tr redoing things, doing rework, right? All yeah. these things are things that are forms of waste on the factory floor. And so just being out there will tell you a lot about what is actually happening then you can start to figure out ways to reduce that waste and and avoid those kinds of activities. Yeah, two things that that frustrate me. Mm -hmm. One of them is installers that don't have some sort of magnet on their arm to hold fasteners because they're always in some sort of weird position trying to install something over their head, and some yeah. weird left. You know, they're just it's an awkward situation, corner unit yeah. type thing. And I think, well, why don't they have a small tool? And it would make sense for the owner to provide this is that that magnetic bracelet, mm -hmm. you know, that magnetic armband that just held a couple of screws or held a couple yeah. of fasteners, whatever it is. Yeah. And then the other one that frustrates me is, and I'm going to speak directly to the audience here is owners who have not taken the step to tell their team, their expectation of what it means to be properly dressed for work at your shop. Mm. To me, properly dressed for work includes your carpenter's apron with a pencil and I don't mean a frame, you know, for a, a lot of us on this show, framers pencil isn't going to cut it. We need, we need a, a pencil that we can mark accurately. You need a tape measure, whether you use imperial or metric and, and a box cutter. You need a knife because they're always cutting things. We're cutting things open. We're un unwrapping things. How often is somebody looking at their shop floor and Johnny's going over to Jeff to borrow a box cutter? Yeah. Or somebody shows up without a tape measure. It's 2023. Mm -hmm. You can get those at walmart i mean it's not like they're hard to get they're everywhere they're at the dollar store they're not great right yeah. 
But there's no excuse for somebody showing up without a pencil, without a tape measure, without a knife, and maybe some other things that are specialty to other people listening because there's some specialty applications here. But that frustrates me, but it doesn't frustrate me about the person. I look at the owner and say, how come you haven't said, this is what we stand for. When you come to work, your uniform is go get the apron off the wall or at your bench, put it on. Your apron should contain that, 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 So that you can hear the soapbox creaking under my weight here. Okay. (laughs) No, I've got, I've got the same soapbox. So as soon as you jump down, I'm going to jump back. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, tools are are a huge source and having the right tools um, nearby, preferably on your person, uh, is is huge because so much time is spent with and, and it's one of the I've I've identified nine what I call offsite wastes mm. which are they're based on the eight lean wastes um, but I've broken them down into more specific activities and actions that actually take place in an offsite construction factory um, that people actually do and tool administration is one of those and that consists of going to get a tool going to put a tool back, uh, changing a bit, a blade or a battery, uh, loading a, a, a driver or a, a some uh, some kind of tool with a with a fastener of some sort, right? Those screws that you mentioned, yeah. having those on your uh, on your wrist, all of that stuff, you know, messing with cords, moving ladders, moving step stools, all that is tool administration. It's not adding a single bit of value, but it's stuff that you have to do to to deal with your tools. Right. Um so that's that's a huge source of uh, of waste. And so having tools on your person is a big hack as far as reducing tool administration waste. Yeah. And, it, it, and I would challenge anybody listening. That's one you can take care of within a week at your company. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Most people here are very well, you know, and, and I should I should apologize to my listeners because everybody who's listening to the show already cares about improvement. So most of them have said, oh my gosh, we don't do that. I should go do that. And they'll, they're going to have it done within 24 hours. This is a very proactive group, but I still see it happening and I get frustrated on their behalf. Why haven't we yeah. taken that small step? When, when you become a company that cares about the small things, your company cares about the small things. Mm-hmm. When you become a company that counts things, you become a company that counts things. And so you track your numbers, right? When you mm-hmm. come a, become a company that cares about quality, your company cares about quality. It's just, it. It's just an extension of the business owner's uh, behavior and, and personality that extends right through the business. Right. It's called yeah. culture. Um, culture, and you know it doesn't it doesn't uh, appear overnight. Culture is a long game. It takes a long time to build because you're trying to get a bunch of people rowing in the same direction and uh, yeah. shooting for the same goals and uh, conforming to the same norms and thought processes, but uh, it's, it's huge. It, Lean really is about building a culture. Um, so it's, uh, it's not, a, it's, there's no shortcuts really. Yeah. Well, in the good news, we talk about it on the show quite a bit. could probably talk about it more, but it is part of the culture of this show is continuous improvement and always finding ways and sharing stories like you did today. I'm sure you've got a lot more. Um, yeah. Danny, if somebody wants to find you and maybe they want to ask you about those stories. How the heck do we find you in this big wide world? Well, probably the the easiest way to learn about what I do and contact me is uh, at my uh, site uh, called leanoffsite.com. L-E-A-N-O-F-F-S-I-T-E.com. Leanoffsite.com. That's a a site that kind of talks about um, some services that I provide and and you can contact me there. You can, uh, I've got a, uh, an ebook that I wrote that you can request there. Lots of stuff that you can do there. So, and there's uh, more stories on there as well, videos and and other case studies that mm. you can read about. Yeah, people love you know videos are just so easy to understand. This actually feels like the kind of episode that people listening could share with their team, mm-hmm. right? Because we're educating people on how to get your head wrapped around this whole continuous improvement conversation. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. I've really appreciated it. Your stories, your answers, it. your perspective. Thanks for having me, Dominic. It's yeah. uh, It's been a lot of fun. I always love to talk shop. Yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll have you back again. That'd be great. Thanks, Danny. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Well, well, well. What did you learn today from Danny about lean, about putting better systems in place, just about thinking differently? And let me ask you, what are you going to put in place in the business? There's so many 
simple things that we can do, simple, tiny changes. You just have to pick one, pick one and focus on that one thing. And then don't change. Just keep doing that one thing for the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, you know, a month until it's where you want it to be. And then add the next thing. It's one of the hard things about turning your business around is trying to go too fast. You have to take a measured approach, as you saw and heard from Danny and I, really good information, good data um, is, is the key. Hey, I want to read you a testimonial. Uh, a couple of tests, actually. I've got two here that are pretty nice. I wanted to read for you. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to leave a testimonial or leave us a Google review or a podcast review, I would very much appreciate it. And again, it's not for me. Please understand. I mean, it, you, I feel good when I get them and we feel good when we see them and Lee and the other coaches feel good when their name gets mentioned. But that's not what this is about. This is about a business owner you don't even know three years from now who's going to be scouring the internet, trying to find information they can trust on how to turn their business around. They are where they're going to be where you are today. And they're going to want to look at something that has a lot of reviews. That's something they can trust. So if you found any value here, go ahead and leave a review or a thumbs up or five stars. Find a place that you're comfortable with leaving a review and leave a review for everybody, for the world to know that we get really good uh, guests. We have great information and it's a good community to be part of. Do me that favor and I'd appreciate it. Anyways, here's a testimonial for you. Um, this is from uh, Helen and Cole, or Helen. Sorry, you'll hear about Cole in a second. So uh, this is from Helen. My husband and I bought the company from the old owner. Cole was his estimator. For two years, it felt like we had no idea what we were doing, even though we have 14 people working for us. Then we found your podcast after seeing you on YouTube. I can't tell you how much we've changed things from what you teach. We just, we just started your coaching program and it seems surreal. It's all so simple. There's even more... And we're so excited. We did our first few EOJs, and that stands for end of job report. And what we're learning is so eye-opening. We've been leaving money on the table, but now we know how to go and find it. Thanks, Dom. So that's great. And that email came to me, but that's actually from the coaching uh, from our whole team. Remember, I have a number of coaches on the team. They're all, they're all excellent at what they do. So I get the emails, but I have to give the credit where it's due to the people on my team who you know are already turnaround experts in their own right. You've got coaches like Lee. Jake, Omzi, Rick, and a whole bunch of other people. They're all very experienced in their own right. And we all get together and we learn better systems for being better business coaches all the time. Here's another testimony I want you to read. Um, it, this is from the middle of a, a larger email. So it's just going to jump in here. Uh, our margins are much better now. We thought making 30% gross was good, but you and Lee finally won me over. With all the new contracts, my margins are right where they need to be. And now I'm making money and things are looking good. And, uh, and I can confidently grow the business knowing that I'm making money with each project that I sell. How's that? That is exact. That's what I'm talking about when I say, put your shoulders back, stretch yourself up, put your chin up by just a quarter of an inch, take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. That's a forward facing contractor right there. You could hear the confidence in that, that tiny little piece of that uh, much longer email. Uh, so listen, we're going to simplify and solve a common problem. Now, by the way, thank you for sending those reviews. Thank you for everybody who's joined the Contractor Strategy Group. 2024 has been a crazy year. Things are insanely busy here, and I really appreciate it. It feels like uh, many of us have finally realized we need new inputs, and uh, they're finding it here on the show or in the community. Uh, by the way, you can join the Contractor Strategy Group on Facebook. It's a free Facebook group, and usually things that are free kind of stink. But the, the Facebook group, we do a good job of making sure that it's just value. It's just business owners and the construction and contracting trades talking about the things that business owners care to talk about. So join us there. Uh, so the common problem that we've got here, guys, it, uh, revolves around the issues of time, team, and money. So if I just say, hey, I, you and I aren't even sitting in front of each other right now. But let me ask you, do you have a problem with time or time management? Okay. Well, what about people, the people on your team? Do you have a team problem? Are you trouble with buy-in, trouble with delegating, trouble with people taking responsibility or ownership for their actions? Are you having problems finding the right people? Okay, so there's time and team. What about money? Could you use more profits? Do you need to understand your numbers a little bit better? Danny and I went over some of that stuff today, but do you realize there's opportunities for you on the money side of your business? If that's a case, I want you to join me for an upcoming masterclass. It's a one, it's a free training is what it is. It's a free training. We call it a masterclass. And the topic is time, team, and money. If you want to join the masterclass, you need to get on the wait list. 
because I need to invite you to it. It's obviously not a free for all or the thing would just get overblown, but you have to get on the invite list. And the easy way to do that is just send me a text and say, masterclass. Many of you have my number in your phone already. The, the cell phone number is 315-903-7853. And then just say masterclass and I'll know to invite you to the next time team and money masterclass. Um, now, listen, it's going to take an hour. There's sometimes there's questions at the end, so it might go an hour and 15 and you want to be there for the questions because you'll hear what other people are asking, but put that time aside in your calendar. We'll send you the invite link and all the, the, the info to get prepared. Make sure you're somewhere confidential or have your headphones in. Now, the reason for that is because we're going to be talking business owner language. Now, nothing we say is secret, but employees don't understand things the way we understand them. If we're talking about time management and delegation, somebody else might hear that and think, well, he just wants me to work harder. And uh, they're, they're trying to do management tricks on me. No, we're not. We're trying to run a business, but be confidential so that you can listen confidentially and also ask questions in confidence. So be somewhere where your door is closed, uh, put your headphones in, et cetera. Uh, and then the other thing, be somewhere you can take notes. Normally this time team and money class would be done over an entire weekend. So that's two and a half days of instruction time. What I've done is I've condensed all of the high points down into one hour. And of course, questions at the end. So sometimes it goes just one fifteen, an hour and 15, but we're going to dive into time, team, and money. Some real high points. I want you to get some action items. You know that I'm very action oriented, very solution and action oriented. So I've just, I've got the, the screen here. If you can see this on YouTube, I'm looking at a separate screen. When we talk about the secret number one, which is time, I want to show you how to take a path less followed. And the reason for that is when you listen to regular news or hey, read the newspaper or magazines, those aren't written for business owners to consume. They're written for everybody else. And so you don't hear about time management from a business owner's viewpoint. Well, obviously in this masterclass, it is 100%, 100% business owner's viewpoint on time and time management. So I'm going to show you how to take a path less followed. There's also a number of downloads here that we don't even talk about on the podcast, but they're part of the uh, the training that goes in the masterclass. Uh, second secret is team. There are six tools to help you hire and train the right people so that you can buy back your time. That's really what you're doing is buying back your time. One of the things that I hope you recognize from the show is that I'm trying to show you how to change your mindset. You know, little simple things like don't worry about hiring the next person. The world is going to pay for that person. Maybe shaking your head and saying, well, Dom, I don't know how that, how's that, that's, that's going to work. Well, we've got tools for you to do that. Management tools, leadership tools, forecasting tools, business tools. If you find yourself as a business owner and you're doing $2 million a year, but you look around, you go, I don't even know how I got here. It's probably time to have a serious conversation with us. Lots of people contact us and they're in exactly that same boat. Um, and then uh, on the money question, I mean, who doesn't have a money question? On the money question, I want to show you how to find and fix your eight profit leaks. Now, we've talked about that here on the show before, but in the training, we're going to go into a little bit more depth, and I'm going to show you how to sync those all together, right? What you want is to make sure those profit leaks don't bleed you dry, and this is where you can find ways to give yourself a raise. This is where you as the owner can get paid. This is where you can buy new machinery. This is where you can find the time to finally take a vacation with your family, or maybe one of your kids is ready to go to college and you are pulling your hair out trying to figure out how to pay for it. This is what we're talking about is the answers to these questions. But anyways, it's the time team and money masterclass, but you have to get on the wait list to be invited because there is uh, an invite link to a private Zoom class to be on there. Of course, we're going to be sharing video on there uh, and, and slides, and you should be somewhere that you can log in watch the video confidentially as well. Uh, so send me a text, just say masterclass at 315-903-7853. All right. Uh, you know what, folks, that's it. Um, I have to tell you, I just had the greatest road trip in the world. I went and spoke for an Amish conference, I guess you could say it, in Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Honeybrook area. Lots of you know that that is the central hub of cabinetry in North America. Uh, I went out there to speak for a, just a fantastic company that I've been working with for many years. Um, if you care about numbers, when we started working together, they were doing 3 million a year. Last year, we came in at 9 million in sales. So the business coaching that we do really works. So they had me out talking to the group. Um, for those of you who've ever worked with the Amish community, just simply the nicest people you've ever met. 
Um, but along with that, I went and met some closet companies, some cabinetry companies, all in that area. And I probably did about 20 hours of driving in four days, so maybe even more than that. Um, I drove a lot, but I got to see people face to face. And this is how I always end the podcast. This podcast is a thin excuse for the time that I can have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine across the table. I had breakfast with Neil Rohrbacher. Fantastic. And I got to see his shop. I had breakfast with Kevin McCarthy and I got to see his shop and we had coffee and we got to like everything. Right. Uh, then I went and saw RSS up in Connecticut um, and we had breakfast. I had a lot of breakfasts. Uh, and then I had dinner with Pete in Pennsylvania. So listen, it was just a fantastic trip. And I actually was doing what I always promised and I'm always looking forward to do, which is have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine across the table, just real humans talking. And in each case, we had such a fantastic conversation. Uh, the breakfast place that I went to with Neil Rohrbacker, you have to walk past all these desserts. That was tough. With Kevin, I got to meet his team. One of his team members is a big hunter and fisherman, so we were trading hunting stories. Uh, with Pete, I got to actually go out with his family for dinner, and that was just a ton of fun. I just loved it. it makes me happy to know that I get to do this. So uh, hopefully one day I'll be coming through your town or your state or your province. And if I do, and I put out the invitation, let's find a way to meet up uh, when we do that. Anyway, you can hear the smile on my face right now. I really enjoyed that. So, and thank you to everybody who hosted me in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut. All right, folks, until the next episode, uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.